Last week we asked the question, what does a healthy church look like? Naturally, Christians have a lot of their own opinions and expectations. When I was serving as senior pastor at St. Paul's, I remember on one occasion, a man who was visiting from out of town came up to me after worship and said that we should not expect any new people to join the church because our service was not contemporary enough. And I reply that most people who worshiped with us did so because we offer something unique, something different from the typical evangelical church. Two weeks ago, I mentioned to you that there is a trend among some younger evangelicals that are leaving their congregations and going to Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches because they've become dissatisfied with services that emphasize style over substance. They consider those services to be shallow and authentic. They long for something tried and true. So what many of them fail to appreciate, of course, is that there are churches in the Protestant tradition, like St. John's and St. Paul's, that are committed to the historic Christian faith and incorporate historic forms of worship to maintain a degree of continuity with the church of the past, forms that we believe honor God and find spiritually enriching. The man who approached me clearly had a certain set of expectations of what the church should be like, possibly because a contemporary service was all he had ever known. We all have expectations. Some are realistic, some are not. When those expectations are not met, we become disappointed and disgruntled. But the question we must ask ourselves is this, are my expectations about the church based on the Bible or personal preference? If we're honest, it's probably a mixture of both, and it's helpful to sort those out. There's nothing wrong with having preferences as long as you recognize them for what they are and they don't become priorities. You cannot determine whether a church is sound or healthy based upon your preferences. What kind of church would you have if every member were just like you? If in your mind you're saying a perfect one, then you need counsel. <laughs> when someone points out all the imperfections of a church, it suggests that they are expecting the church to be perfect. But naturally, they'll never find such a church. And even if they did, it would no longer be perfect once they joined. If a church has more than a few people, you can be sure that not everyone's preferences will be realized. What we have to do is prioritize the values that God highlights for us in his word. And as we do so, we will not only experience a greater sense of unity, but contentment as well. Everything else is icing on the cake. So last week we noted that in this final section of Acts chapter 2, that this reveals a pattern for what the church ought to be like. Luke gives us four marks of a church filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've already considered the church's teaching and fellowship. Today we want to focus on the church's worship and witness. So first, the church's worship. If you would look at verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The impression that we get from the early church in this depiction is wherever we go, whatever we do, we're going to go through it together. That comes from an old song, but I think it was true of them. That bond of togetherness is so prevalent here. But that bond runs counter to our culture. Uh, people today are so individualistic that the biblical ideal of community seems strange to them. We like to live private lives without interference from others. We open up segments of our lives to certain people because that's a necessary part of living in society, but that comes nowhere close to the biblical portrait here 
of devoting ourselves to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. The fact is, we are social beings, communal beings, and we cannot find real fulfillment in life unless our community life is meaningful. Whatever you may think of the lockdowns in 2019, whether they were necessary or not, they did have an undesirable effect on our mental and emotional health because we're not meant to be isolated. We were forced to develop new habits during the lockdown, like worshiping from home. I didn't like that one bit, principally because I had to hear myself sing instead of the congregation. I'm glad you like that thing. Some uh, feel that television has taken away from people the need of being involved in Christian community. I think that can be viewed as an opportunity because life without community creates a deep void in people's lives, which the church can fill if we get down to truly practicing Christian community as described in the Bible. There's an element of our worship and our faith that cannot be experienced in private or by watching a service on YouTube. There are some graces and blessings that God only gives to the public assembly with other believers. We were made for more than private devotions. We were made to worship Jesus together. That's what the saints and the angels are doing in heaven right now. They're not isolated, worshiping Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. There's this huge throng worshiping the Lord, a multitude that no one can count, and we're going to join them one day. The church is supposed to be a foretaste of what heaven is like. Corporate worship is the single most important means of grace and our great weapon to fight for joy because like no other means, corporate worship includes the preaching of the word, the sacraments, fellowship, the collective praises and petitions and confessions and thanksgivings of God's people. Perhaps you can identify with Martin Luther who uh, in his experience of cor corporate worship as a means of grace, this is what he said. At home, in my house, there is no warmth or vigor in me, but in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Do you ever feel like that? Sometimes we, we come to corporate worship under a spiritual fog. We've had a busy week. There are matters pressing on our minds and perhaps the hard knocks of life have, in this fallen world have taken the wind out of our sails. They can disorient us so we become fixated on things of this world instead of what's truly important. We need to clear our heads and recalibrate our spirits and jumpstart our slow hearts. Sometimes we don't even feel like coming to worship, but instead of staying away from corporate worship when we find ourselves to be spiritually lethargic, that's precisely the time that we need the awakening of worship more than ever. When your heart feels it least is when you need it most. Your soul needs to be reminded it is good to be near God. And those early Christians drew near to God in worship, which was characterized by a couple different elements noted here, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now in the original language, there's a definite article before both terms, so it's literally the breaking of the bread and the prayers. It's highlighting something specific. Many scholars believe that the breaking of the bread refers to the Lord's Supper. There's a breaking of bread noted in verse 46, which does not have the definite article, so it refers to something in general, like sharing a meal, but here in verse 42, it's something different. While it's an ordinary means of grace using ordinary bread and wine, the Lord's Supper is an extraordinary meal because the Lord Jesus himself is our host who invites us 
to come to him in order that we might be spiritually nourished in our weakness. There is a spiritual union among believers and with Jesus that is strengthened and solidified in the Lord's Supper. And that is not to be taken lightly. Now, we can't be sure how often the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper, but it was a regular part of their worship, which reinforced their bond. And that's why we need to make sure that we're here every time we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. We need that reinforcement as well. As we come together to the Supper to feed on Christ spiritually, he draws us closer, not only to himself, but to one another in the body. He knits our hearts together as we share in the, the bread and the cup. The other reference of breaking bread is in verse 46. Look at that for a moment. It says, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and general hearts. Well, this is another aspect of just eating together, spending time together over a meal. And apparently this was an important part of church life. This is one reason why I think Baptist churches grow faster than Presbyterian churches, because Baptist churches have more potlucks than Presbyterian churches. <laughs> the first Christians needed that time to interact, to to share, to learn from each other, and as they did, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Fellowship around food was a predominant feature in the early church, and it should be no less important in our time. Now, whatever individual churches do, whatever they decide is best for them, this practical ministry around food, especially Italian food, involving mutual sharing, and conversation seems vital to forging relationships and fostering a sense of unity. In the Middle East, so Agnes and I served in the Middle East. In the Middle East, this is just part and parcel of, of daily life and of your social life. You, you gather around food. If you go to someone's house, they're serving you something. If you go to a store, they'll serve you tea and something to eat. That's a way of showing hospitality. But it brings people together. I think one of the challenges for uh, Christians in America is developing deeper bonds with others in the church. On Sunday, we say, hi, how are you? How is your week? But there's not much time for a significant conversation. We try, but there's little time. So we have to create other opportunities to develop meaningful relationships. Now, one of the blessings of this congregation is that you are a warm and friendly bunch. And visitors have sensed that, which is great. What I would really like to see is all of us participating in a small group, whether that be our home groups that are spread out over the area or our men's group that's meeting every other Friday at Four Rivers or a future women's group. It's in those sorts of settings that we can exchange thoughts about the Word of God, share our lives, start to be vulnerable, get connected, especially if you're new. That's one of the best ways to get connected with other people. And if you have questions about that, please let me know and I can tell you about some of those opportunities. For those of you who know each other well, I'm sure those get-togethers happen very naturally, regularly, but let's do that for those who are new to the church as well. Notice that the church's worship was both formal and informal. It took place both in the temple courts and in their homes. I think it's always healthy when more formal services of the local church are complemented with the informality and liveliness of small group meetings. And the church benefits from both. And I, I think that that you can benefit from both if you're not already involved in that way. And then as it relates to prayer, Luke seems to suggest that whenever these Christians met together in the temple or in their homes, 
they set aside time to pray together. The disciples were not content just to talk to each other. They wanted to talk to the Lord Jesus as the head of the church. And certainly prayer was a part of the remarkable growth of the early church. The importance of corporate prayer cannot be overstated. Whenever we get together, let's pray for God's blessing in order that we might be a blessing. This is the way that Psalm 67 expresses it. Lord, bless us. Why? So that we might be a blessing to others. If you receive our newsletter, you know that some of us have been prompted by the Lord to meet on a weekly basis to pray on Wednesday evenings in downtown Winter Garden. All of you are invited. I realize maybe all of you may not be able to attend. What are we praying for? We're praying for godliness, grace, growth for Jesus' sake, and of course, that many would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus through our witness and the witness of other Bible-believing churches in our area. I've been asked, can we pray for revival? Will prayer bring revival? Well, ultimately, revival is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen frequently, but when it happens, what's primarily going on is God is heightening all the graces that he bestows upon the church, including the proclamation of the gospel. But it only lasts for a season. Those revivals don't last forever. They last as long as God wants it to last, but they always have enduring effects. Prayer cannot guarantee revival, but it does appear that a movement of prayer often precedes revival. That is to say, God prompts his people to humble themselves, to cry out to him for transformation and the transformation of society when he intends to act. Now, most of you have probably heard of the first great awakening, I wonder how many of you know about the Second Great Awakening. How did it start? It all began with a 48-year-old businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear, who gave up his business, determined to siege the throne of grace for the success of the gospel in New York City, both among the poor on the Lower East Side and the prosperous Manhattanites of Wall Street. So Lanfear sat under the preaching and guidance of J.W. Alexander, who was the son of Archibald Alexander, who founded Princeton Ceremony, uh, Ceremony Seminary, very godly man. J.W. Alexander was the pastor of 19th Street Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, and his preaching emphasized the Holy Spirit's work of, in salvation and the importance of prayer. And Mr. Lanthier invited one and all to meet at the North Dutch Reformed Church at noon on September 23rd, 1857, to join him in prayer to implore God to convict sinners and to bring repentance in the midst of that great city. Who said Presbyterian and Reformed believers don't like to pray or they don't not concerned with evangelism? We are. So by 12:30. Only one other person had joined him. After an hour, six men in total poured out their hearts to God for mercy. Lanfire did not give up. And within a week, there were 16. In three weeks, there were 40. They prayed for unsaved family members and friends. By October 18th, there were consistently about 100 people joining him to pray to God for revival. The economy went through a crisis, really a crash, in, the, in late October of that year, and 30,000 New Yorkers lost their jobs. By November, the church was so crowded that the men who came to pray every Wednesday at noon, that they had to use every floor of the church. Soon, prayer meetings were being held in all churches all over the city. Hundreds of people had confessed faith in Christ. The newspaper editor, Horace 
Greeley, who worked for the New York Tribune, sent a reporter out with horse and buggy, we're talking about 1857, to ride from one prayer meeting to the next to see how many men were praying because he didn't believe the reports. And in one hour, he could only get to 12 meetings, but he counted more than 6,000 men confessing their sins, praying for revival. Other cities followed their lead. Cleveland, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Chicago, with five to 10,000 praying businessmen and others in each city. And then there was an editorial in the New York Times in March of 15, 1858, the following year, and this is what it said. Let, listen to this. The great waves of religious excitement, which is now sweeping over this nation, is one of the most remarkable movements since the Reformation. Did I just get cut off? Hello. Well, I can speak loud. <laughs> Travelers relate that in cars and steamboats and banks and markets, everywhere through the interior, this matter is an absorbing topic. Churches are crowded. Schoolhouses are turned into chapels. Converts are numbered by the scores of thousands. In this city, we have beheld a sight which not even the most enthusiastic zealot for church observance could ever have hoped to look upon. We have seen in a business quarter of the city, in the busiest hours, now think about Wall Street when this is happening, assemblies of merchants, clerks, and working men to the number of 5,000 gathered day after day for simple and solemn worship. It is most impressive to think that over this great land, tens and fifties of thousands of men and women are putting themselves at this time in a simple and serious way. The greatest question that can ever come before the human mind, what shall we do to be saved from sin? Some people believe that during that time, one million people came to faith in Christ. That was the last great revival that America experienced. To be replaced by the Civil War and then economic excesses that America had never yet experienced. That Fulton Street Revival, as it's known, began with one church, one church concerned about their city, one man commissioned to start a prayer meeting and a few earnest Christians willing to pray. That's it. Today, the New York Times reports with glee the overthrow or the downfall of Christian society. What we... George Whitfield could speak to like crowds of tens of thousands of people. I, he had a megaphone for a voice. That was a gift from God. But anyway, I thank God for microphones. And uh, what, what we want is we want to see another spiritual awakening with real faithful preaching, real repentance and faith, millions of converts to the Lord Jesus that permeated that former generation. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think God can do that again? Do you? Do you believe that God can fill this auditorium? Yes. Okay, we, we got some Baptists here today. There we go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Presbyterians say, well, if they're elect, they'll come. And go. Well, that is true. But, um, you know, I, I'd rather it not happen that way. I'd rather we grow to a certain point and plant more churches, but I think we need to have a, a big vision and trust God for big things. When I say that God's given us a vision to reach the community, I mean the entire community, from North Winter Garden all the way to the bottom of Horizon West, from Ocoee to Claremont, uh, we don't have to be big in order to be successful. Being successful in God's eyes is simple obedience, but I think 
there is something to the perspective of William Carey, who was the father of modern day missions, went off to India and started a movement that, that shook the world. William Carey said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. The Lord has already given us his great commission. He's already given us the power to fulfill it through the Spirit. And he says, go and make disciples. No reason to wait. Step out in faith. I'm with you. I go before you. I'm beside you. I'm in back of you. I have all authority in heaven and on earth. I can overcome every obstacle, obstacle that comes your way. Just trust me. You be faithful and leave the results to me. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And that leads us to our last point. The early church was marked by its worship, but also by its witness. The end of verse 47 fills out the picture. It says there, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those first Christians in Jerusalem were not so preoccupied with teaching, fellowship, and praying that they forgot about witnessing. The Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit who created a missionary church. Notice what it says. The Lord added to their number. God forbid that we should ever think we could bring anyone to faith or take any credit for it. Now, the Lord did it through the preaching of the apostles and the witness of the early church, and yet he did it. Again, we share the gospel, we leave the results to God. The Lord Jesus is the head of his church and he alone bestows salvation from his throne. This doesn't make evangelism and missions unnecessary, it makes it hopeful because he is able to do it and intends to do it. We also notice that the Lord added to their number those who are being saved, that is, he did not add them to the church without saving them, nor did he save them without adding them to the church. Salvation and church membership go together. And then he added people daily to the church. Their evangelism was not programmatic. Just as their worship was daily, so was their witness. Praise and proclamation were both the natural overflow of hearts full of the Holy Spirit. Now, the text doesn't imply that this will be the experience of every church at every given moment, but the church's witness ought to be continuous. As Christians, our evangelism must not be limited to specific occasions for outreach. We talked about this morning in our Sunday school class because we're talking about evangelism. Evangelism is to be a lifestyle. You trust God for open doors and open hearts, and you're intentional in sharing the gospel. We want evangelism and missions to be an overflow of our delight in God. We don't want it just to be a duty, but a delight. That delight confers more honor than duty. My wife, rather be honor her because I want to rather than because I have to. You delight yourself in the Lord and then you declare the goodness and grace of his gospel, eager to draw others into worship because you're so passionate about worshiping the Lord Jesus. When you're in love with somebody, it shows, right? You let others know that Jesus is the love of your life and the joy of your heart. Even if you're struggling, you can still communicate that message of hope. That's being authentic. If you're declaring the hope of the gospel that you yourself are clinging to in your trials, you are being authentic. So this morning we looked at the remaining features that mark the early church. And as we humble ourselves before the Spirit, determined not to quench Him, He will manifest these marks among us as channels of God's grace and vessels of God's blessing.
biblical teaching, loving fellowship, reverent and joyful worship, and an ongoing, outgoing witness. As we evaluate our church against these standards, we see evidence of these things, some more than others. At this moment, I think we are stronger in areas of teaching and community than we are in prayer and evangelism, but we're just getting started. We're just two months in, so there's plenty of room for growth in all these areas. So let's thank God for what we do find trusting that he's going to cause the ministries of the Spirit to blossom among us. And let's be willing to sacrifice personal preferences to focus our energies on what's most vital. Lastly, let's keep in mind that the Lord is much more interested in the health and maturity of his church than we are. He is the head, and his plans for the church are so much higher and greater than any of us can fathom. So even though we might be quick to see weaknesses among us, the church as the body of Christ is the very best that the Lord does for us. So let us be grateful. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for teaching us this morning. Like these early Christians, grant us a spirit of wonder and anticipation about what you can do in us and through us. Like them, may we live in all of your greatness and glory. Every day, may we be conscious how great a God we are worshiping. Help us to love one another with sincerity and simplicity that characterize these believers. And like them, may we be marked by a desire to live the totality of our lives for the sake of Christ, so that your church may be all that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen.